Uh, it's, been, it's been a profound few months and a big part of my uh, religious trauma syndrome recovery. And so I'm super grateful um, and, and appreciative uh, of having this opportunity. Um, I do feel a little sheepish because I've been here uh, for the Bible studies and I've really enjoyed those. So I kind of feel like, you know, when you go to like a, a nice play or a theater and they say, oh, the lead is absent, and you're disappointed that they're not, they're not here. But um, nonetheless, uh, I'm grateful. And I think this will be pretty good. I do. <laughs> uh, either way, um, I always sort of start out something like this with saying it's either going to be good or it's going to either be bad, right? And that's really just about me. That has nothing to do with you because I want it to be good because I want to offer you something um, and I want to be a resource. And I hope to some degree I say a few things that are helpful, but it could also go off the rails and I, you know, and I might not recover from that. And the good thing though, is well, I have to listen to it too, right? I have to hear everything I say. So I think we'll be okay if we get through it together. Um, and that's sort of my stick on like fundamentalism and how it relates to religious trauma, right? We, we tend to try it in psychology, mental health. We do this a lot. We try to identify good and bad, and often we lose some meaning in that, and it creates some inner turmoil, if you will. So I'm going to go for it. If you have any um, questions along the way, please interrupt me. Um, I'm always willing to, to pivot. Um, I love being a psychologist. You know, it's so fascinating to be one. Um, you just get to see a whole unique side of human nature, right? It's really uh, profound. I've been doing it for about 20 years. Um, and I like to, I, I just like to be in that role, to be honest with you, and, and be a part of someone's uh, healing process. And we get, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's so hard. You hear about so many problematic things. And yeah, yeah but you're generally around people who want to improve, right? So you're generally around people who want to change and that's inspiring. Um, and so I, I love that part. There are parts I don't love about psychology. Um, we tend to reduce people to traits sometimes, right? Like we, we sort of uh, deconstruct to a point where you could say uh, we dehumanize and, and part of that is sometimes we aren't aware of our own biases. So a lot of our training is around that and still it's hard. Um, I tend to believe we're all to some degree in a fishbowl, right? We all have context. You're reading things that I'm doing that I'm not even aware of because you're looking at me. I'm not looking at me. <laughs> so there's things that, that we aren't sure uh, about in terms of what we are presenting. And I think that's a healthy perspective. I think we always give off things we're not aware. And that creates vulnerability, right? Um, and, and so I do a lot of assessment work. I do a lot of diagnostic assessment. So I'm, uh, I clarify diagnoses. Um, I usually get involved in crisis situations and, and people want uh, clarity or they've been in therapy for a long time and it's not working uh, and so things like that and when I do my work has evolved to, to including positive sides of people and that might not seem very uh, radical but in psychology it sort of is like we, we tend to focus on the negative because we want to help um, but we need to be a little more balanced in our approach, right? And, and so uh, we can be very fundamental in, in, in mental health. And then the, only, the last thing I'm gonna mention I love is nouns over verbs. Um, I think we have to really be careful about this when we diagnose. Um, you know, when we say somebody's experiencing depression, right? Like they are not depression. And, and so, um, we really, um, I, I think a lot of times uh, we use words as nouns because we want to think we're smart <laughs> and look smarter. But, you know, that, that's just my little take on that. But I, I, um, I, I always get concerned about how we do that. 
And so I'm just going to jump in uh, to a definition for religious trauma syndrome. Doesn't come across as the happiest of terms, um, but to me, it represents the opportunity to change and, and to grow. And, and so the fact that we can identify it is important and, and we, can, we can move on from it. There's two main ways that this comes uh, into someone's life. Sometimes we're born into a religious uh, organization, um, into a church, uh, we grow within it. We're a part of the community. Sometimes we choose to be a part of a community. We're inspired. So the irony about that aspect of it is that religious trauma syndrome begins with hope. It, it, it begins with inspiration. We, we want to change our lives. We, we feel a call to faith, a call to serve, right? And so um, that, that becomes the impetus of either a trauma or a struggle in our life that, uh, that we are trying to navigate, uh, if you will. So this is interesting, um, to me at least. Uh, and I might be the only one that finds this interesting, so I apologize uh, for this, this slide. But there's no official diagnosis of this in our manual, right? So you're not gonna be able to bill your insurance for, for religious trauma syndrome. Um, that's problematic to me, but uh, I do know that despite that, practitioners like myself uh, use it. And why do we call it a syndrome over a disorder? And again, this doesn't really fit exactly um, the way I would like it to, but a disorder is usually considered a disruption to your life, right? And, and we all experience that. Uh, I've had a lot of anxiety in my life and that, uh, that has been disruptive to say the least. A syndrome is your entire life absorbed into something. And oftentimes you sort of know, sometimes you don't, but you know when you're depressed, typically, you know when you're anxious, you might not know that you're experiencing this. And that's the, the part of that is so overwhelming, right? It's so overwhelming. Um, and so your entire life uh, is traumatized, really. You can also think of it like multiple traumas. It's another way people look at this. If you have PTSD, you typically identify one trauma. Religious trauma syndrome is multiple traumas. Um, and I want to make a point. Um, I'm going to go into fundamentalism here, but that's applicable to all religions. So we know that, right? It's, it's like fundamentalism is a big part of politics. It's, it's, it's everywhere. But I'm going to take a particular aspect of it, but I, I, want, to, I want to go over that with you. And so I'm going to look a little bit at Christian fundamentalism but uh, clearly, again, that's not exclusive. And then I do want to mention, I, I don't want to traumatize anyone in talking about this. Um, and if you need a break, or you, yeah, please, please, please take one. Um, if you can't uh, feel comfortable being here, I totally respect that. I want to be a resource regardless if I'm talking to you now or later. Um, that, that's, that's really important to me. Um, so here is uh, fundamentalism defined. I'm going to start broadly. It's a movement or attitude stressing strict and literal adherence to a set of basic principles and a strong belief in the importance of distinguishing one's in-group and out-group. So that is really important, right? You're either in or you're out. All the people on the left, are my friends, you guys are not. Like it's sort of like that sort of divide, right? Um, and, and it comes with a strict, fixed and rigid set of beliefs, right? And so you have to know what those beliefs are. Um, and then the fundamentalist 
movement with Protestantism originating in the 19th and 20th centuries in the U.S. and Britain, and it emphasized the literal adherence to a set of basic principles. Um, I kind of, um, I, I, I'm a math guy, so I kind of see fundamentalism and math as sort of connected. There's, there's sort of, they're sort of formulaic in the way they're presented, right? And when you look at it that way, um, their fundamentalism at its core is fairly easy to get. You know, you, you kind of know what you're, what you're supposed to believe or what you're supposed to experience. Um, comes with a whole complexity on how it's presented, and emotion get into that, and and all of those things, but. In the end, it's sort of basic math. And again, from a mental health perspective, because um, I'm not making any judgment on the right to believe what you want to believe, but when you affix to a strict set of beliefs, it really goes against psychological development. That is not what it, we know from the research historically um, that benefits uh, uh, your, your psychological development. We are human beings who learn from our environment. We're, we're, we, are, we, are, we are often in situations that are new to us. And so we have learned to acclimate. And when you believe a certain set of beliefs and you stick to them despite all the things you might see to the contrary creates psychological dissonance um, and so um, and then it does so affects cognitive processing how you think you know how you make sense of things um, so it has a large uh, negative impact in my psychological opinion um, interesting right like why why do you have to why, why does this happen? Like, why do you have to adhere to a certain set of beliefs, right? Well, a lot of times, at, at least from a, 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 a organizational perspective, it's really about challenges from the outside. It's about other information coming in and um, response to theological modernism and cultural modernism beginning in the 19th century that sought to revise traditional Christian beliefs to accommodate new scientific discoveries and developments. So more information was coming in at that time um, and people were starting to question some of the religious dogma they were hearing. And in response to that, fundamentalists said, you're wrong. No. That's not true. That's basically what they said, right? That's not complicated. You're wrong, and we're right, and here's why. And the Bible is, it, biblical inerrancy is a huge part of that. It's probably the part of that. And that they had felt that that, that particular perspective was losing traction at the time. So, um, and here are the things that are at the core, it's not everything. Um, I could do a long talk on fundamentalism, I'll spare you that, but the core Christian fundamentalist beliefs, uh, and I intentionally bolded biblical inerrancy, literal and true, literal, sorry, literal and true, and it's reversed context, right? Now the irony of that, I don't, again, I don't think any of us get out of the fishbowl, like, like, there's always a context, right? So it's sort of, um, it's sort of problematic, again, from a psychological perspective, to remove context from truth. You can imagine how, you know, we've seen it, how destructive that can be. Um, virgin birth, atonement, uh, resurrection, the second coming. Here's to me... Uh, and I've experienced this, and maybe some of you have. I think one of the hardest things to get my head around psychologically is trusting in salvation. Right? What I mean by that is from this perspective, 
Jesus is the only way, right? That's the only way to salvation. And the question that haunts people, and I'm talking from like people I've worked with in ministry, lay people, um, all kinds of individuals, this question about being assured that you're saved sucks. <laughs> it's so hard to deal with because in the end, it still relies on you to trust yourself. And we have so many reasons not to trust ourselves. I don't even trust myself going to Costco, let, let alone like trusting my salvation. That's a lot of pressure. Um, and from a mental health perspective, it's highly problematic. Now, I'm not saying everybody struggles with that. But what I am saying is that when you get yourself in a mindset that you want to be saved a particular way and your eternal life is at stake, the stakes are huge, right? They're huge. And, and so you're relying on a feeling. And, and you can be told that just trust Jesus, just trust. But again, that's about trust, right? And the irony of that is like we shouldn't trust ourselves all the time. <laughs> so there's sort of a, a weird, to me, doubt that in, to my, in, in my experience working with this um, never goes away. And, and I think that's by design, but I don't think that's healthy. I, I think it's really um, challenging, and it leads to a lot of anxiety, which can also go into depression. And it's very, very difficult. Having tried that, whew, I'm glad uh, I'm not trying that anymore. Um, but it feels good to have answers. I, I love having the answer. I mean, I, I you know, I just can't. Um, I, I uh, like I said, I have a math background. I was a math tutor for so long. I love that job. That was so much easier than being a psychologist. <laughs> um, but it feels good initially, right? It feels good. It's attractive, right? It's attractive at first glance. You, you want to be a part of something where you're given answers to questions that you have uh, anxiety around. Um, and then uh, these are some other questions. I'm going to run through this a little bit. Um, I think that atheism and fundamentalism are kind of comparable. Um, they're both absolute. Uh, and so they kind of can be on the other side of the coin sometimes. And I find that interesting. These are just questions that I tend to ask. Um, so I'm going to go into my personal experience. Um, it starts with my mom. Uh, she was a nun. Um, she was born and raised in Long Beach. She entered the comet at age 20. Um, she was one of 560 nuns and the sister of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And I don't know if any one of you have heard about this, uh, this group, but they were really cool. Um, they were very radical. And it was in the 60s. And um, she was caught up in that. She was, she was only in her 20s, right? And so she was in Catholic school. She met these cool nuns, and they inspired her. Um, at the time, she didn't feel there were other opportunities she really wanted to pursue. And this, she had felt a calling, right? Um, which was, I think the word dampened, because it wasn't <laughs> extinguished, but it was dampened by the rules and regulations that they don't necessarily tell you about when you sign up. Um, and some of those clearly had sexism, patriarchy, imperialistic kind of tendencies um, documented. Uh, and, and then the irony, right? Like you're sort of living with the same rules that a psychiatric hospital would, would um, impose or encourage. Um, and so you can't see it, but she's in that picture somewhere. <laughs> yeah, she's in the top right, but, you know. Um, and so she, she had this incredible arc of um, joining this community, um, 
being disillusioned, but then they got inspired. And why were they inspired? And again, I'm not going into the whole history, but Vatican II. Vatican II comes up, opens the doors to different ways of thinking, different ways of being in religious communities. And the church made the mistake that they didn't know people were going to take it that seriously. Um, and they just took off. And you, I, I hope you get a chance. I'm, I'm going to try to um, play the clip. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so Vatican II was a meeting, a historic meeting in Rome. And the Catholic Church was trying to modernize itself. And it was, um, it was, it was thought that they wanted to sort of catch up with modern times. They felt like they were falling behind. At that time, the Catholic Mass was in Latin. So it's very hard to relate to that. Um, part of that too was wearing, uh, the nuns wearing the habits. That the idea behind that was that it was excluding them in the community more than including them. So they were trying to become more responsive, particularly in the 60s when things were shifting. Does that answer? Thank you for that question. Um, so, and this is the film. I, I really encourage you uh, to watch it. And if, when Jacob comes in, I'll, I'll, I'll show it. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how to do it here. Um, but it's called Rebel Hearts. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, and I love it. It's really kind of funny when I watch it because I get so into it. You know, it's part of my, my history, right? And then I'm like, oh man, like my mom would have been a great career nun, you know? But then I like, oh shoot, but then I won't be here. So <laughs> yay for, you know, for Cardinal McIntyre, uh, <laughs> who, who ends up sort of being the villain in this. Um, but it's really inspiring. And this is Sister Corita Kent. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with her. That's a name to, to really uh, inquire about. She... Um, created this incredible art, uh, again, radical. Uh, these are some of the examples of, of her work. Um, and just, um, uh, my mom knew her, was inspired by her, did some of her own art after her. Um, and then um, this is one I actually have, which I'm, I'm really, uh, feel blessed to. And so I would really, I think she does some really great stuff. It's, it's worth it's worth checking into. Okay, so what happens? Well, my mom has this experience. She's in her twenties. What the way uh, this particular religious order was very progressive. The church didn't like it. Church said, "Get in line or get out." Basically, and when that happens, three hundred nuns leave and create their own community and it still exists. And I love that part of the story. Um, about seven years so sort of fall in line and adhere to what the church is saying. And then the rest leave completely. And that's about 150. Can you imagine like a company losing that kind of like, like labor? <laughs> and, and this had a huge impact on nuns in general. And they've ne it's never required it's never recovered. They, they continue to lose numbers. And so this was a real turning point uh, for nuns in the Catholic Church. And my mom went through a ton of losses. Can you imagine, like think about like 10 years, right? 20 to 30, basically. She lost her community, she lost purpose, uh, she lost meaning, self-confidence, acceptance, hope, comfort, joy. Um, and the gains of that, which is, kind of being facetious here. Um, social isolation, apathy, deep sadness, ambivalent self-doubt. So really, really hard. And, and, and she didn't feel like she could stay. It was too difficult. So she left and she started, uh, she was a teacher at the time. She, she started to teach, she, she drifted around. And then, um, she really became engaged in a process that is fairly common, uh, and it comes from Marlene Winnell, who's a PhD 
has had her own experiences in evangelical communities. And this is a process that she's identified and I've modified it a little bit, um, but it sort of gives you an idea, right? And nothing is linear. Um, this, uh, it, it's almost a misnomer to, to create it this way. The other thing is if you want the slides, you can, I definitely can, can forward you these, um, email you these. Separation, voluntary or involuntary. Either you leave on your own um, or you are asked to leave or you're told to leave. Um, and then there's this period of time, right? Where you're, again, you're so absorbed that you're like, how did this happen? For my mom, it's like, why did I become a nun in the first place? And there's sort of this self blame unfairly, irrationally, that why did I put myself through this, right? And so um, when that is sort of process, there potentially is the avoidance stage, and that's to, I don't want anything to do with religion. And so a lot of people that go through this syndrome never go back into organized religion, which to me has a little bit of sadness to that. Like, I totally respect people. That's... People have to do what they have to do to be healthy, period. Um, but there's something, for, for me at least in my personal journey, that makes that a bit sad. Um, feeling. Feelings flood back. I didn't know, because you have been pushing them away for a long time. So you feel it, and you're like, oh my gosh. And that can be really, really um, intense. Um, and, and healing. And then you, I like the term spiritual wanderer. Uh, Winnell uses this in the book. And because you are forced to search almost. And, um, and to me, that means not giving up. Um, I, remember, I remember thinking like, I was so mad at the Catholic church that I would say like, oh, you know, even if Jesus came, like, Jesus isn't going to define my Christianity. <laughs> There's like a defiance to that um, that has helped me. Not always, uh, but it's helped. Um, some people compare being removed from a community or leaving a community as, as a divorce. My mom would use that a lot. She'd say, oh, it felt like a divorce. And then I think there's some, uh, it's particularly with grief, um, and the feeling stage, confusion stage, you can see some aspects of kubler rosses stages of grief. There's some overlap there. Um, okay. Okay, I gotta go quicker. Um, so my mom goes, she, she be, she's a math teacher, right? High school math teacher. She drifts around, she ends up at a math conference and she falls for a guy who happens to be a Catholic brother which is the same as basically a priest. And I remember telling her, like, why would you do that? You know, like, like why would you choose somebody to order from a church that sort of burned you? You know, but, you know, and she'd always say, well, you wouldn't be here if I didn't. And so that was, that was pretty much where the conversation ended. Um, also a math teacher, friendly, kind. My dad was very traditional, though, and ritualistic, almost compulsive. Uh, OCD, he loved the, the repetitive nature of his order and his participation. And if you didn't um, know, a brother is similar to a priest in the Catholic tradition, right? But they were very much involved in teaching and, and worked in the high schools, particularly on the East Coast. And so they end up falling in love. My dad wrestles with this. Because he never, he went in from 18 to 40. It sounds like a prison sentence when I say that. But, like, that's a long time. Like, he really was a 40-year-old virgin. Like, he, he had no clue what it meant to live in the secular world. But he loved this woman, and he wanted to make a life for himself. And he spent a year in solitude thinking about it. <laughs> so my mom wasn't so crazy about that. But thankfully, she, she waited. Um, Three kids, I'm the oldest, and what happens? In this family that's so rich in tradition and faith, we don't talk about faith at all. Um, and it's very fundamental. 
you know, what, what was taught to us. And, and it was really mostly about my dad not getting upset. He was so consumed with the fact of his own salvation because he could not ever reconcile. My dad never had regrets for being a dad and loving us. And there's nothing like that, but he could never, he could never recover completely from dissolving his vows, dispensation. And so that ended up really tweaking us, right? Because we, we had these deep feelings. My parents were very committed to their professions. They, they stressed values, um, but they would rarely talk about this. I only got this later in life where, where I really pushed them. Um, and then what did that require from me? Rule following, principles over the observational, conformity over self-interest, which I have wellness. And so I was really conflicted. I would really want to be a part of the church, and then I'd want to defy it when I was there. And that really doesn't work very well, um, especially for me. And it was so hard because I longed for that kind of community, um, and I, I, I longed to be in, somewhere where I could express my faith, and it just never worked. Um, and these are some of the reasons um, why. Um, you know, it, it's hard to um, think, of, uh, you know, my parents would say, think independently. They raised us to take care of ourselves, and yet the church is saying, think this way uh, or that way. Um, and here's a list of the things that I struggled with and at times continue to struggle. Um, you can meet it here. Um, I am a workaholic uh, for sure. Um, and I think probably the most destructive thing in all this is rationalitis. Um, you might, some of you might have this. But rationalitis is where you think everything can be explained through reason. Good luck, right? <laughs> like, good luck trying that. Um, it would make my job a lot easier if I could just tell people what to do and they would do it. Um, that would be great, but it's not, it doesn't work that way. And compromising relationships. I threw in domestically disabled. Um, I have this thing that I, you know, I don't advance the laundry very well. If you put a list with me and I take it to the store, good luck, you know, because I'm always in my head. I'm always thinking about stuff. That's my excuse. So I try to convince my wife that I'm domestically disabled, you know, so you can't really blame me when I don't, you know, do the things I should do. And she said, don't weaponize incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Um, some of the ways to get beyond re uh, religious trauma syndrome. Uh, I, what the, and these are things that have helped me, like being a spirit, uh, a spirited, I put spirited, which is interesting, uh, spiritual wanderer. I've done a lot of different things. I took place in a sweat lodge community for a while. And then secular beauty, there's so much in the world that it's good and beautiful. Um, and, and, and I think um, that that can be really uh, effective to, to really embrace. Don't afraid to lose your faith. Uh, I, it's a hard one, right? Like for, I definitely went through this um, because I don't really, um, what I was taught in many ways wasn't effective. And I thought there's no way, you know, if, if this is the way God's going to be, I don't want to be, this, uh, I don't want to believe in this God. And so um, going through that is painful, but per, but in the end, helpful therapy, unresolved questions. Sometimes it's good to just live with those. And I like use fundamentalism. You're good at it. This is one of my favorite things to do. And I don't, you know, probably just says more about me. Um, but I love to take an evangelical sermon that I really don't agree with. And I'll like go through it and I'll take notes on it. And they're just notes for me. Um, and I'll identify where are the fundamentalist thoughts, right? And then I'll go through it and go, okay, how is emotion conveyed to get those thoughts uh, conveyed? And what is really being asked of us in this sermon or in this preaching? And to me, it helps. And, and I think it's sort of using those fundamentalist skills 
uh, to reverse itself. Um, God's sakes, be nice to yourselves. So many people, particularly that go through this, weren't treated very nicely. Uh, try to be patient with yourself. And then finally, like embracing the positives of fundamentalism. There's definitely things that I retain that mean a lot to me. Um, it wasn't all bad. It took me a long time to get there because I was so angry. Um, but um, but there were things that were were presented to me. Uh, I have this weird image of God that I just had for years that I recently recovered. Um, and it's God in a cloaky judge thing in the sky, sitting in the clouds with his, his like this. And it reminds me of, I forget that sculpture, The Thinking Man. I must have seen that as a kid and like associated it. But, but that's an interesting thing. And so what happens is um, you constantly, when you have this, you're constantly surprised by what comes in your head because you're kind of cons constantly reprogramming in a way. And so, because the more comfortable you feel, this has happened to me going to church here, something will pop in my head. And one of them was a lot of Catholic churches I went to forced you to go out the back. And they wanted to do that so they connected to you, right? And that freaked me out. And when I realized that I could go out the side door here, that was a blessing to me. And it was weird, right? But now I could get hooked on that and go, oh my God, what's wrong with you? What, what's your deal? But no, um, it's just, it's a curious, interesting thing. Here's my parents, God bless them. Um, they, uh, they um, were great parents in a lot of ways but they never truly resolved uh, the pain that they felt uh, with what had happened. And it's weird for me, cause like they, they had that ability um, to really give to people. And I think they would have been complete uh, religious leaders in their, their perspectives. But again, thank God they didn't do that. <laughs> so. Um, and so this has culminated, and I apologize. Oh, good, we're on top. Um, this is for me has culminated in today. Um, and I have realized that I need a ritual to kind of move beyond some of my history um, and move into the next phase of my life. And so I'm getting, having a baptism ceremony in like 15 minutes. I get to promote my own baptism, so that's pretty cool. Um, I invited all those people behind uh, <laughs> behind us. We'll see if they show up. That was two days ago at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, that's my wife, Nancy. She's a physical therapist at uh, Pilgrim Place, and she, she loves it there. So um, I apologize. I didn't leave enough time, but I still will take questions. Um, any questions from anybody? Yeah. I could. Thank you for sharing. Your sure. Time, first of all, I really appreciate it. Um, I could definitely see the value of addressing religious trauma when people um, really want to have some kind of spiritual religious connection. Right. Um, but I think there's also a lot of people who are have religious trauma that aren't necessarily searching for that yes. in their lives. Do you think it could still be of value to the church? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, everyone has, a, to, in my opinion, everyone has a right to their own journey. And, and I don't uh, have any take uh, on where that goes. I think people can be very happy and fulfilled in a variety of, of different healthy ways. So it's a great point. Yeah, that's my bias. Well, I'm, I'm sharing a little bit of my bias when I say it's sad, but it's I, who cares that I think it's sad? <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
right. we're telling you what we are saying and what you're thinking of. And so I'm still struggling uh, with self trust in any situation. Constant question. So there must be, see, there must be a basis of some kind of self trust. Yes. Uh, at least in a well individual. If I don't, I'm always looking, I'm never trusting myself. Then you have to explain. Or, yeah. or, or I can, if I have to do, I avoid fall back in trusting and believing in other. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah, and a quick comment on that. I, I love that you said that. Um, I think I there's there's a healthy level uh, of distrust, and I would base that on the fact that we're often not right, and 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 we have to have some comfortability around that. But you're right. We have a, there has to be some level of self trust. I think you have to go easier on yourself, part of it, if you're wrong. To me, um, trusting yourself, in essence, is having a healthy distrust of yourself. Yes. So very, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.